Check one, check two. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 1230 breakout session of the Open Simulator Community Conference 2013. As a reminder to our in-world and web audiences, you can view the full conference schedule on our website at conference.opensimulator.org, and you can post your questions in local chat, on the Ustream chat, or tweet your comments using the hashtag OSCC13. This hour, we are happy to introduce John Lester, who will be representing who will be presenting Exploring the Interconnected, How Past Dreams Evolve into Future Reality. John Pathfinder Lester is a leader and expert in knowledge management, 3D simulations, multi-user virtual worlds, and immersive learning. His background is in neuroscience research and medical education, and he previously worked at Harvard Medical School, Massachusetts General Hospital, and Linden Lab. John is currently the Chief Learning Officer at Reaction Grib and Incorporated, helping clients develop new systems for immersive learning using next generation virtual world platforms that integrate with the web and mobile devices. Welcome, John. Great. Thank you very much. It's, um, it's wonderful to be here. I'm just, uh, I'm just amazed at how this whole conference has, has taken off. So I just want to thank you, Joe, and everybody else, all the volunteers, everyone who's worked so hard to make this happen because, um, you know, it's. I think it's just a stellar success. Um, I've met so many wonderful people here, and I've I've seen so many wonderful presentations. It's just fantastic. So um, let's give a hand to the organizers <laughs> um, because they really they really deserve it. Um, and thank you very much for for coming to my talk. The uh, uh, the slides. So you should be able to see the slides behind me. Um, there is a little bit of a delay with my voice and when I advance the slide, so when I advance the slide, I may pause for a few seconds just to make sure everything catches up. Um, but the title of my talk will be Exploring the Interconnected, How Past Dreams Evolve into Future Reality. And you'll be able to get these slides um, with all of the um, hyperlinks because I always like to have links to additional information in my slides. Um, but you'll be able to get these slides by going to that URL, that bit.ly URL. And just remember that bit.ly URLs are case sensitive. So um, just type in that URL and you should be able to, to get to my slides. And they'll be up on, they're up on SlideShare. And um, as Joe mentioned, again, thank you, Joe, for that introduction. Um, my goal with this talk is really to just talk about the, um, the, the history of how I've seen things evolving in terms of interconnected grids, how things were back at Linden Lab, how things evolved in OpenSim, my own personal journey exploring how grids connect via the hypergrid, and hopefully... Um, just give a little bit of insight into how how dreams of the past evolve into future realities, and sometimes it's not completely a straight line, right? Sometimes it's a uh, actually most of the time it's an organic process. So I'm going to be talking about um, some of my initial experiences with OpenSim while I was still working at Linden Lab, and also um, how I set up my own region initially in Jocadia Grid, which is an OpenSim grid and uh, then eventually setting up my own standalone grid and my, my explorations with the hypergrid with a group that I put together called the Hypergrid Adventurers Club, which is, um, which is really fun. Oh, someone asked me to type the URL in chat, so I'll do that here. Uh, there we go. And I'll actually paste that into the uh, Ustream chat as well, because I know some people are on Ustream. There we go. Let's see, next slide. You've already heard about me. Uh, my nickname, when I was at Linden Lab, I chose the, the nickname Pathfinder, because everybody has to choose an avatar name, a uh, surname, you know, something in the last name Linden. And I didn't want to be John Linden because that's like being John Smith. So I chose Pathfinder just because I, I always liked the nickname. It's, a, it's evocative and describes how I like to look at the world. Um, and I've kept it. I've kept the 
nickname Pathfinder, even though I no longer work at Linden Lab. I worked at Linden Lab from 2005 to 2010. And my background is actually in, in healthcare, in neuroscience, and in um, medical education. So I'm very interested in immersive learning environments. And since 2010, I have been working at Reaction Grid, where I'm the chief learning officer. And I uh, work to help develop really new, new immersive learning environments for clients who are primarily um, academics and um, educators and, and businesses too, people who are interested in, in, um, in learning within companies. So past dreams, um, let's see here. Great, okay. Um, anybody recognize this, this image? This is from Second Life. I'm trying to see if anybody in the picture is actually sitting in the audience. I can't tell. Um, but this was my, um, these were my office hours when I was working at Linden Lab. One of the things that we, we started doing at Linden Lab back when I was working there, and this was again between 2005 and 2010, was we created a space, and this was actually my project, uh, I, I took the lead on this, we created a space in Second Life called Linden Village. And I basically claimed a whole bunch of land and parceled it out and gave plots to different Linden Lab employees for them to build, uh, for them to create whatever they wanted to. And most importantly, for them to have a space where they could meet with people and talk and have conversations. And these conversations were, um, were really, really amazing. And, and over the years, many Linden Lab employees took advantage of this. And um, you can actually see my avatar um, I can use the little pointer. You should see a little 3D, um, 3D little red arrow pointing to my old avatar there um, with the wings. <laughs> that was a lot of fun. So we would sit around and we would talk. We'd have conversations. And these conversations would also be about, uh, you know, not just about what was happening currently, but also about the future, right? Also about where things might be going with virtual worlds. And those, those were very productive talks. And this is actually me in, in real life on the left, uh, the bald guy. <laughs> um, and also what was really wonderful uh, was my experience to, um, to create the, uh, and to set up and to manage and really to build out the infrastructure for um, Linden Lab's initial East Coast presence in Boston, the Boston Lab. So we grew that from, um, you know, it started out with um, the folks, the employees that we acquired from uh, Windward Mark Interactive, the folks who did the wind light integration. They became employees and they were the initial core for the Boston Lab, including myself and a few other people. And that grew up to be, well, when I left about, um, I think about 50, about 50 people. And all of those people uh, <laughs> on, the, on the table, um, uh, our employees or were employees. I think um, I think the only one who is still left is uh, Nix Linden. I think, yeah. Um, but that was a great time too. That was, and I wouldn't trade that for the world. I had a wonderful time um, with that group and uh, talking about the future of Second Life, and not just the future of Second Life, but at least back in those days, we talked a lot about what we felt the future of the metaverse would be. You know, it was it was very much a pervasive idea that we were thinking about where this could all go um, in the future and even where it could go beyond Linden Lab, beyond Linden Lab's involvement. So there's, uh, I, didn't, I didn't mean this to be a morbid slide. I, I just felt very touched when I left Linden Lab, when I was laid off along with a whole bunch of other folks at Linden Lab. Um, they put up these little memorials you know, and some people thought, oh, it's really morbid. It's like you guys died. And, and I didn't see it that way. I saw it as, um, I, saw it very, I felt very touched because it meant people knew we were, we, were, we were moving on to something else in our lives and we were no longer working with the company. And these, these memorials, I felt, were very, um, they touched, well, they touched me very deeply. So, so anyone who was involved in those, thank you for, for that. Um, that was actually the avatar I was wearing. It didn't feel right for me to show up wearing my 
you know, my uh, Pathfinder avatar because my account was converted to a, a resident account. So my Pathfinder Linden account became Pathfinder Lester. And I still have the old avatar, but it didn't feel right, you know, walking around with my old avatar. Um, so I was... Um, I put on a Buddhist monk avatar. I felt that was appropriate and walked around and looked at my memorial gravestone. Um, <laughs> but uh, I thought it was very touching. So, you know, the, the thing about dreams is they start and they end, right? And they evolve and they change. Um, and really, you know, that, um, you know, that's what happened for a lot of us at Linden Lab. Um, so let's, let's look a little bit at... Um, um, some specifics. Um, if you go to YouTube, you can find this this video, and it was uploaded um, by Torley back in um, 2008. And it's a video called Across the Metaverse from Second Life to Open Sim. And it shows examples of folks at Linden Lab teleporting from the Second Life beta grid to an open sim grid being run by IBM behind their own behind you know on their own hardware behind their own firewall, um, and it was really interesting because it you know back back then we were thinking all you know you know I, I don't want to say all of us because not everyone at Linda Lab always felt the same, but a lot of us were really thinking about how Second Life could be part of a larger ecosystem of of, of grids. And how it might interoperate with technology like OpenSim, which was just starting out. And I have to tell you, I remember being back at Linden Lab. And when I first started hearing about OpenSim and we started seeing examples of what was happening with OpenSim, we were blown away. And we were genuinely not, we were, the overall feeling was one of genuine amazement. Because here were people who were so enthusiastic about this concept of a multi-user, 3D immersive, everyone can edit everything in the same environment, in, you know, metaverse. And they were so excited about it that they were going on their own and expanding on the technology in a way that wasn't, it wasn't infringing with ours. You know, they weren't stealing anything from, from Linden Lab. They were just expanding on it and creating an open source version that um, could potentially create a much larger metaverse of interconnected, um, interconnected worlds. And this is fascinating. I have to tell you, everyone, I remember everyone at the lab just going, holy cow, who are these crazy smart people <laughs> who, are, who are doing this? And it was, um, it was a really amazing point in time. It was really amazing. Now, this slide is... Um, this is the only slide with a bunch of text on it. <laughs> um, although there is a picture behind it that I need to talk about too, which is important. But this is really the, the timeline of, of past dreams with, with lots of hyperlinks to specific moments in time. And it covers a period of, of, of only six years. And that's not very long if you really think about it, right? If you really think about it, you can zoom in on that, and when you download the slides, you can, you can click on everything that looks like a hyperlink. But I'll go over these really quick. Um, back in 2007, this was when at Linden Lab, you know, we were really excited about the idea of having, having a, an open grid protocol, of some way of connecting with, with other grids, like open sim grids. And so Linden Lab started the architecture working group. And you can still find these documents on the wiki. And that's what those links are to. So that was back in 2007. Think about that. You know, that was uh, six years ago. And in 2008, that was when that video was created of, of the teleporting between the Second Life beta grid and IBM's open sim grid. And that was also a very special year because 2008 was also when Krista invented, the op you know, invented open sim's hypergrid system. When she came up with her proof of concept, that's when she, 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 she conceived of it and actually started to implement it. And, back, and then in 2009, there was actually a larger working group charter that was something that was not explicitly run by Linden Lab. It was part of the IETF, and it was the Virtual World Region Agent Protocol Working Group. And basically, this was going to be a group looking at standards to interconnect 
a larger constellation of virtual worlds. So not just talking about Linden Lab and Second Life. This was about, a, you know, the bigger picture stuff, really, really big picture stuff. And, you know, again, very exciting times. Uh, you go to 2010, of course, that's when uh, there were the, uh, the major layoffs that Linden Lab did across the board, at, of which I was part of. And that was the year that Linden Lab officially said, we are no longer going to be involved in the in the virtual world region agent protocol group and we're not we're not going to be focusing on virtual world interoperability and then in 2011 um, that was when the the VW or VRAP working group uh, officially shut down and Krista has a really good uh, post-mortem explaining from her perspective you know what were the causes and of course you know nothing is ever because of one particular reason it wasn't just because of Linden Labs ceasing involvement there were there are other factors involved there you know there were the, the challenge with any big picture idea like the VRAP working group is that it's big picture it's hard those are, those are the hardest things, hardest things to do, right? And so there are multiple reasons why it, uh, it finally just, just kind of lost steam. And then um, 2013, I think, is very exciting because this is the, uh, the year with the release of OpenSIM version 0.7.5. Oh, and I see Krista's in the audience. Yay, Krista, thank you for all your hard work. <laughs> um, that was released with Hypercrit version 2.0. And um, if you read only one link on this page, read the last link where it, on, for Hypercrit version 2.0 because that is Krista explaining um, where things are and where they're going with Hypergrid because it has moved far beyond a proof of concept and, a, and a let's see what we can bolt on to this system that doesn't really want to do this in the first place to, to really a thoughtful system that involves things like permissions, how to handle the transfer of content and how to transfer, handle the transfer of, of avatars between different, um, between different grids, which is all very important. You know, we, we, all, we all may have, di may have different ideas about what levels of digital rights management should exist, um, but I think that's good. It's good to have people not all agreeing and to have debate because that's how you get the, the, the right answers to the hardest questions, you know. So this is the timeline of how, I, you know, I basically sat down and wanted to put together all of the past dreams that I could find involving the interconnectedness of, of, of the world of grids, right? And what was wonderful, because I put this picture on the background, I, all of my slides always have lots of images, and when I put this picture on the background and I was putting together this timeline, which actually took a while to tease out all of the details and summarize it, um, I realized, if you look at the next slide here, that the, the, in my mind at least, the background image kind of summed it all up, what happened, right? If you look at this background image, you see that it's a, um, you know, there's a beautiful, there's a beautiful uh, stair, staircase, stairway, and there are walls, and you're obviously part of some building. But you can also see where things are kind of crumbling and falling apart, and you can also see where, where trees have grown up through the ground, pushing aside, you know, the, the, the organized planning of, you know, whoever built this, uh, this building. Um, that's really what happens. That's that, in a nutshell, I think is is really the reality of how past dreams evolve into future reality. You have things that are built, that are created, that you expect that will stand the test of time, and they're, they they crumble. And then other things grow up. They sprout from between the cracks, and become sometimes more formidable than the original construction. You know, the, you can imagine how these trees probably are higher than the walls, right? You can imagine how the, the exactly organic growth, you can think about how what has grown naturally. And in some ways, you know, the, you have to remember too that, you know, the, the, what you've created will foster certain types of unexpected organic growth, right? You may be laying the groundwork to enable a certain type of organic thing to take root and flourish and be much bigger than your original expectations of anything. Um, so, Kamara, I don't remember where this, um, where this is, this picture. 
Um, I honestly can't. I need to find out where this was taken. I didn't even take this picture. I can't. I found it in my, one of my folders, <laughs> so I need to. I need to find out. But it is an open sim somewhere. I know that it was something that either somebody gave me or a, a link or something. But I think it's just a beautiful metaphor for how past dreams can evolve, right? And I think it's important to realize too that the um, that evolution and growth. The future always arises from opposing elements. It's about things pushing against each other and leaning against other things and uh, you know, things pushing out of the ocean into the sky and the contrast between air and water and light and dark, organic and, 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 and rigidly planned growth. Um, that's how the future grows. And the best thing you can do is, is really um, observe what's happening very closely, just look and see what's happening all around you and do whatever you can to help encourage the positive growth that you see around you. Whether it's growth that somebody is cultivating specifically or organic growth, right? I think that's the, uh, that's the key. This is a picture of, of um, I was very proud of this little kind of weird sculpture I made in the ocean. This is from my own Open Sim Grid Pathlandia. So if you want to see this particular um, image, you can go to my grid. Thank you. I'm glad you like the colors. I like purple and I don't know, purple, more purple. <laughs> and the other thing to remember is organizations and companies really are not living creatures, they are not singular entities. Organizations are conversations. An organization and a company in particular is the sum of all of the memos happening, you know, flying back and forth. It is a sum of all of the meetings that are happening both in conference rooms as well as the impromptu discussions around water coolers and in, ha and in hallways and meetings after work over drinks and, and email flying back and forth and conversations between the company and its customers. Organizations and companies are conversations, and conversations can change very quickly. So when people say, you know, people ask me, well, what happened? You know, what was the cause of Linden Lab walking away from interoperability? And like anything else, there are multiple reasons, right? There are multiple variables. I think some of it at the core was it was such a big picture idea because it involved not just thinking about um, – and I remember some of these conversations with, with many folks at the lab. It involved not just thinking about interconnectivity, but about changing the fundamental business model of Linden Lab. And that's a scary conversation to have for any company. Because basically, what Linden Lab was, you know, the ideas that were being tossed around, one of them was basically, you know, what would, you know, maybe we need to get out of the land business completely. Maybe we need to just be like the Federal Reserve Bank and control some kind of interconnected economy that links all of these disparate grids, whether they be OpenSim or Second Life or maybe something like Second Life Enterprise, people running their own Second Life grids behind their own firewalls. And those are very hard conversations to have, right? For, for any organization that has to face a bottom line because companies face the bottom line of revenue. And if somebody tries to start a conversation about, you know, basically turning everything on its head and it would have to be something done very quickly, those are very dis difficult discussions to have. So I think part of the reason, in addition to just things like the layoffs, which were, you know, it was just because of a matter of, a lot of that was just, you know, people who used to focus on inter interoperability were suddenly no longer around. They were just gone. Um, I think it was also just a, a um, it was such a big challenge. It was such a big idea. And, and I'm not entirely sure any single company could really come up with the best solution to it. Because companies have to face these bottom line issues. Companies have to, you know, uh, have a lot of harsh realities. And they are not, they are not, as, they are not completely 100% navigatable. You can't turn on a dime, you know, especially if they've been around for a while. So I think what um, was fascinating to me was how when, um, you know, as Linden Lab basically was putting aside its ideas of, of interoperability, and, you know, for better or for worse, it is what it is, 
conversations change within companies. The, the company that is Linden Lab today is a very different company, a completely different company, completely different conversations than when I was at Linden Lab. But what was fascinating to me was that um, you had this community of, of developers, the open sim developers, the people developing Hypergrid, the people you and the people using those platforms that really started to um, say, okay, well, we're just going to go ahead and try and do whatever we can. We're going we're gonna to do something, right? You know, I think there's a lot of um, potential for answering some of these bigger questions, in particular the, the VRAP working group talking about interoperability for for a lot of um, you know, uh, for, for, for generalized virtual worlds but at the same time what gets me very excited is what are people actually doing now right what are people building now what are people experimenting with now um, I was I was very um, inspired uh, at one point I remember Krista when you said something about how you know you just wanted for hypergrid you just wanted to throw something out there to see if you can actually hack something together and make it work right you know there's a time for sitting back and defining standards and theorizing and debating and putting together white papers but then there's a let's build something and actually get people banging on it <laughs> right let's get something actually running and out there and see what happens when people use it and then from there, use you know, then grow some of the answers to some of the harder questions. And and in my opinion, I think that that's a really good way to do things. It's 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 uh, important to sit back and 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 work out visionary standards and plans. But at some point, you have to move into um, um, actual tactics, right? You know. You have to strategize and then execute on tactics. And what is that? That saying from uh, uh, you know, strategy is uh, str you need both, right? Strategy without tactics is the longest road to victory, but tactics without any strategy is the noise before defeat, right? Uh, you need you really need both. Um, and I like this picture too because that's actually me. I've cloned myself as an NPC. You know, it's it's an illusion that any kind of organization is made up of everyone who thinks exactly the same. You know, I think that's the other the other illusion that we have to remember that organizations are not just conversations, but there are lots of different people, right? Lots of different people. Okay, so moving moving along here. Um, I love this picture. People recognize what movie movie this is from. This is from. Uh, I won't say it. Someone will say it in chat. <laughs> you recognize the movie? It's Time Bandits. Time Bandits. Um, I I always get a lot of inspiration from the you know the the statement that you know the and the idea that perfect is the enemy of good. Perfect is the enemy of good. If, if you're constantly striving for perfection, that is deadly to the implementation of anything good, right? You don't have to be perfect. If all you ever strive for is perfection, you will never actually create or do anything of, of actual, you won't execute on anything. Um, it's always good to strive to perfection, but but uh, at the bo at the end of the day, perfection really is the enemy of the good. Or good is is good, and in many cases, it's it's more than good enough. And frontiers of any kind, you know, those rough, rough edged environments for exploration. You need people who are pioneers and who are willing to take risks and who are willing for things to break. Right? Who are willing for crashes and things to blow up occasionally. And and I love this. Um, movie time bandits because it, it one i can't remember when it happened to me but it hit me i, I suddenly thought well the hypergrid is exactly like the map in time bandits because the universe when it was created you know had some holes <laughs> it was far from perfect so the ultimate creator of the universe made a map mapping out all of the flaws <laughs> in in the creation of the universe and those flaws could let you jump between space and time points all right you could jump you could uh, basically hypergrid teleport to different locations and different time periods, right? So, so that's where I, I really, um, I got a lot of inspiration for um, um, this hypergrid adventurers club, which I'll talk about in a moment. Um, so when I left 
Linden Lab, the first thing I did was I just started looking at lots of different virtual world platforms, and I uh, very very quickly got a, um, a a region on Jocadia Grid, which I don't know if Jocay is around here, but Jocadia Grid um, is is around still around too. It's doing wonderfully, and um, that was where I cut my teeth on how to do things in OpenSim. And I encourage anyone here who's interested in just starting out at OpenSim. Um, of course, my heart is is um, is uh, you know will always be with Jocadia Grid because they were the first place that I went to, and they have wonderful customer support. But there are wonderful grids around here where you could basically rent a region, right? Go go through the expo, see who's there, see, you know, talk to people. But I would encourage you to try. You know, before you try setting up your own server, try just renting something from, from someone else because it's a great way to learn and also to get connected to a larger community. So I set up a little island there. You can see that was my first boat. <laughs> that is my Viking boat. And that picture of the, on the sail is a, a rabbit from uh, the, uh, it's from the animation from the um, uh, Watership Down. Right? That's where I get my blog's name, Be Cunning and Full of Tricks. Um, that's a quote from, from Watership Down. But anyway, I set up a little plot of land and planted a weird tree on Jocadia Critter, and it was fantastic. And that was where I started the Hypergrid Adventurers Club. And this slide here is a picture of the map. I use that as the logo for the club. Um, because the idea was we were going to be exploring the Hypergrid. So this was back in 2000, maybe late 2010. <laughs> And I ran the I was the Hypergrid Adventurers Club was very active for two years, basically late 2010 um, through 2012. And um, this is what we used to do in the Hypergrid Adventurers Club. We would um, meet in Jocadia Grid and sit around a campfire, and we would talk about places that we had discovered on the Hypergrid, and then we would uh, walk up to these gates that I started creating. I called them, or somebody came up with the idea of a blam gate, because basically I, I scripted it so you walked into this gate and it would just instantly teleport you to oh, across the hypergrid to another grid. And this is based on code that uh, Maria Korolov posted on Hypergrid Business, which was wonderful that she shared that information. And, um, and this was, remember though, this was, this was like 2010, 2011, right? That's, that's ages ago in terms of hypergrid. That's like back hypergrid 1.0 and 1.5. And it was a big uh, adventure because there were a lot of bumps. <laughs> you know, it was hard to find different grids. Um, we would basically uh, line up here. This slide, I love this slide. We would line up in front of a gate and I would program a gate and I would be like, today we're going to go to Franco Grid. And everybody line up, and a lot of these folks had never taken a hypergrid jump before. And again, this was, you know, this was a couple of years ago, so it was still, it was, it was very bumpy, not so, not half as smooth as it is, as it is today. And we would walk up to these gates, and the gates were scripted so, like, when you walked through them, they would explode <laughs> with, this, with these sparks, and people would be like, "Whoa, John walked through the gate. I hope he's okay. You know, see you on the other side." It was, it was, it was awesome. Um, and again, a lot of these folks, there were a core group of, you know, probably about 25, 30 people who used to come at least all of the meetings. And over the years, you know, there were probably, um, probably a couple hundred people who cycled through the club. Uh, we would go through these jumps and sometimes things would work fine. We experimented with different ways of making hyper gates because, you know, one of the problems with those round donut looking gates was like only one person could go through at a time. So I came up with this taxi. I called it the hyper taxi. Group rates available, <laughs> where you could just click on the taxi, and basically everyone could click at the same time, and everyone would be jumped to um, uh, to another hypergrid. And um, of course, this was not without um, major bumps along the road. I remember this photo. And this was basically everybody in the hypergrid adventurers club. We all were rezzed into the same body <laughs> I don't remember where this was mm. oh it was just hilarious uh, <laughs> so it was a teleporter accident right um, but the wonderful thing was um, we would appear 
on some other grid as a crowd. Yeah, we would lose hair. We would lose shoes. I gave up trying to wear shoes after I lost like my 20th pair of shoes over the years. And, um, uh, and we would just appear in different locations. And if you're looking at the slides, these are just, just examples of, you know, we would appear suddenly be like a flash mob. And we would just appear. Here's, here's us all appearing. I think this is Metropolis Grid. Yeah, Metropolis Grid. There, and there were people there from Metropolis Grid, and, they, and again, remember, this was like a couple of years ago, right? Hypergridding wasn't very, very common, and they were freaked out. They were like, where the heck are you all coming from? What, how did you get here? Sometimes we would you know, jump into a grid via the Hypergrid, and the owners of the grid had never seen anyone come across the Hypergrid before. It was amazing. Um, here's, uh, you know, and we would appear in sometimes, you know, I'd bring people and, and people in the group would recommend locations over time too. Sometimes we would appear in some little Chinatown. Yep. That's, that's in, uh, Franco grid. And sometimes we would appear in strange locations like this one, where it was, um, a simulation of a laboratory and we were all basically, you know, honey, I shrunk the avatar world. You know, we were running around on the tables about the size of, of mice, Right. And um, we would see things that were amazing abstract art. I think this was on Franco Grid too. Well, that was New World Grid. That was the lab. That's right. The lab was on New World Grid. We would see abstract environments. And then occasionally we would stumble across grids that were just so detailed. This, you know, here's an example of a, of a, a whole cityscape. I mean, look at this. This is um, amazing. And if you see at the top of the slide, there's a link to the Hypergrid Adventurers Club. That'll take you to the blog, and I always blogged e about each adventure. So you'll see, uh, you know, two years worth of, of blog entries of going to these different locations. I can't remember exactly where this was. This was, um, I want to say Rowena Grid, but it may be offline now. I can't remember, but I can find that out. Um, and then I always loved this one um, of Franco Grid where um, they were building a real life-size and fully realistically detailed Eiffel Tower, and you can see all of us um, on the bottom. You can see the scale of all of us hypergridding in. And it was amazing. And this is where I have to say, um, you know, I've been to so many wonderful grids, and they're so awesome, so many wonderful places, but I have to say, in particular, definitely visit Franco Grid at Christmas time because they have a winter carnival that is amazing and you can ski, you can get really goofy looking sweaters, you can get gifts, there's a scavenger hunt. Um, the folks at Franco Grid do a fantastic job of uh, putting on this winter festival. It's amazing. So definitely visit Franco Grid at Christmas. <laughs> so what other kinds of interesting things did I see and did we experience in terms of exploring the interconnected world? And again, in some cases, it was interesting because here were hypergrid connected environments that people weren't really exploring them across the hypergrid. I think our group was really the first group to do some serious hypergridding um, in terms of you know large numbers of people jumping from one place to another. And one thing that just started springing up was sometimes we would visit a grid and would have hypergrid turned on and people would be able to build and the, whoever set up the grid basically was just leaving it open for people to create things. And so we started as a group basically being a flash mob of content sharing. And I don't know if you can read the, the letter that I wrote there. That's a flyer that I would, I would plant on the ground and it says, greetings from the Hypergrid Adventurers Club. We visited your region and found it empty with the ability to build turned on. So we've left you some freebies we hope you enjoy and find useful in your work. Please do with them what you will. Happy adventuring. And so we would find sometimes these grids that were kind of empty, maybe and some of them looked like people had set them up and had not ever actually done any work on them. And so we would, you know, this was an example where we put out all these trees and content and a little sign. And I always thought this was wonderful because this was, uh, it felt like leaving a message in a bottle. Right? We didn't know, was, you know, maybe the grid was forgotten about. Maybe it was running on a server that no one remembered. Maybe um, the owner was just, um, uh, you, know, um, you know, gone and, and not interested in running it anymore. Um, the, other, the other thing that this reminded me of was um, 
that science fiction movie from the 1970s, uh, Silent Running, if you remember, where they take a forest and put it inside of a space dome, and basically he, the, uh, the lead character in the movie lets it loose into the universe, hoping someone will find it and take the, the forest and help it grow somewhere else. And so I always thought that that was, um, that's what this kind of thing reminded me of. You know, there's a sense of, here, let's give these people some content on their grid and maybe they'll come back to it and it'll help them, um, you know, these freebies will help them uh, grow their own grid. And then another phenomenon that um, I thought was fascinating, that continues to go now, go along now, is occasionally you'll see on, on the left on this slide, this is a hyper, a hyper gate. It's a, um, um, it's a, it's a system, and actually it, you should really definitely check out the website. I'll type it into chat here. Uh, hypergates.com. It's a device that you can plant on your ground and it automatically will help you get connected to other grids that are on the hypergrid that also have a portal on their ground. It's a wonderful networked device. And, I, as, and sometimes I use these portals to, dis, to explore other hypergridded worlds and discover them. And I started noticing people were putting flags next to them. People who were visiting these environments, if they found the ability to build turned on, they would plant a flag and say, hi, I'm from such and such a grid, from such and such a country, and I was here. Please come visit my grid someday on the hypergrid. Now, just think about that phenomenon for a moment. It's, I mean, it's so beautiful. It's, so, it's such a wonderful example of, of the organic emergent behavior that can happen once you start connecting things to each other and allowing people to create these connections on their own, right? If you look at the, these are flags on my land, um, on my Pathlandia grid. Um, and if you zoom in, you can't really see on the slides, but you can see, you know, they show different countries and there's hover text typically that says, you know, come visit my grid, here's my grid's URL. Planting flags. I mean, I just think that this kind of, of emergent behavior is so, is, is so, is such a great example of the pioneering spirit that's happening right now and is continuing to happen as we look at the best ways to interconnect all of these different grids via the hypergrid. Right? This, this kind of emergent behavior is, is, is beautiful. Um, I set up my own grid, Pathlandia. This is a picture of it. Um, and um, you can go and learn more about it. But I basically st I started with uh, um, Diva's uh, standalone uh, software and also open sim on a stick so that I didn't have to set up a database. I basically just run it off of my desktop and it's it's connected to the hypergrid. You can't get an account on my grid. It's just for me to log in locally, but you can visit it over the hypergrid. And that's the whole point of my grid is it's something that other people, anyone in the world can come and visit. And all of the things that I find that are freebies on my journeys, I put out on my land and pretty much 99 0.9% of everything there, you can take a copy of it because it's it's a freebie, right? And and I think this is, the idea of something like this, I think is really fascinating because it took a little work for me to set it up. It wasn't too bad, but the, the networking, right? The hyper, you know, how to connect it to the, the network, that took a little bit of doing. But imagine if at some point in the future you could have a single piece of software like you know, a viewer, a combination, maybe viewer and, and hypergrid gridded software, where you know you're able to just basically run your own local grid constantly in the background on your PC, and as long as it's turned on, you can actually access the grid whenever you want, and you can make it open to the world, and you can have people from around the world visiting it. Um, I think the power of allowing anybody to easily set up their own uh, grid is uh, is very exciting, and I know that there's um. There's a New World Studio. Has, uh, I haven't tried their software out yet, but anything that allows people to create their own grids and easily connect them with each other, I think, is, is, um, uh, is a future reality that has a lot of potential. I'm just taking a sip of coffee here. This is a um, picture of Pathlandia. It's, Pathlandia is running right now. That's how I'm logged in here. It's running on my desktop machine, which never gets turned off. 
And I logged into it, and then Hypergrid t- jumped from Pathlandia to the conference where I am right now. And this is, you know, Pathlandia. I spend a lot of time, sometimes I'll just be logged in sitting around a fire. And you can see in the background of that image, there's a, a kiosk for the Hypergrid Adventurers Club. Um, and um, so coming toward the, the end here, um, future reality, again, the, the future is always going to be this evolution and striving of opposing forces pushing against each other, right? So we'll, we'll, I've already seen a lot of conversations here at the conference, you know, people talking about digital rights management versus, versus brand new business models, you know, conversations around, you know, protecting, we must protect existing revenue streams versus we got to bet the farm. You know, you don't, you can't win big if you don't bet big. And then there's a lot of, you know, we need to stick with what we know versus we need to embrace the unknown. And this applies to everything, not just uh, hypergrid, but I think, you know, server development, the viewer development, you know, whether we should stick with, as a community, stick with, um, you know, following what LinLab is doing, or should we strive out completely into the unknown and do something completely new? Um, I think the key to remember is this is always going to be a, uh, this is the way it is. <laughs> it's a, it's a, sometimes finding the middle ground, it's not just black or white as these bullets are. Sometimes it's gray. Sometimes it's in the middle. And it's an organic process. The future is very organic. And um, ultimately, you know, healthy futures require freedoms. And I think this is one of the critical things um, about the evolution of past dreams into future realities, that ownership is a critical freedom. A limited use license is not ownership. It really is not. And any kind of technology that allows you to save your content locally and then migrate it even to other platforms, in particular actually to other platforms, is a very good thing. And this is why I've been so excited about the Singularity Viewer having the feature that allows you to export prim-based objects in OpenSim or Second Life, as long as you're the creator, um, to industry standard mesh models on your hard drive, which you can then pull into things like uh, Unity 3D-based worlds, like a Jibe world, which is the, the platform that we develop at uh, Reaction Grid, a Unity 3D-based web-based environment. So I think a- a- as we're growing, as we're seeing the space grow, keep an eye out for anything that allows you to take your content and, and do whatever you want with it, and, and in particular migrate it to other platforms. Because um, the key to the metaverse, I think, is not just having a singular monoculture of, of worlds, but to have an interoperability in the, in the grand future, uh, higher levels of interoperability, and that means not just moving avatars between different worlds, but also moving content, right? So I think it's a good thing. I get very excited when I see things like this with Singularity Viewer. Um, so in conclusion here, um, I think a good strategy it really comes back to what I've always seen happening in in, uh, in virtual worlds is you know sitting around campfires. You know, as a community, um, I think it's very good to build campfires and gather around these company com- uh, these comforting campfires. And, and conferences like this are like gathering around a campfire. If you think about it, you know we're we're gathering around a, in a common place at a common time, talking about things that we've done, sharing ideas. It's comforting. And then at the same time, we have to walk out into the unknown night <laughs> together, right? To continue the exploration of the, the edges and the, the rough parts of these frontier technologies. And I think that's a strategy if you're trying to take your current dreams and grow them into future reality. Um, I think it's a strategy that works very well. And, and that's it. All right. Thank you, John, for a terrific presentation. As a reminder to our audience, you can see what's coming up on the conference schedule at conference.opensimulator.org. In this room, the next session will be Language Quest and Data Analytics in Secondary School with Gerheil Meisel Egghart. Thank you again to our speaker in the audience. We'll be back shortly with the next session.